if we don't get a deal, if we don't have a deal, if, if there's absolute intransigence, if there's an unwillingness uh, to move on the things that are important, President Obama has always said, we'll be prepared to walk away. It's not what anybody wants. We want to get an agreement. But I've said from the moment I became involved in this, we want a good agreement, only a good agreement. To John Kerry, it is part of his legacy. To the President of the United States, it's also what will help set him apart in the annals of history. And to the Iranian government dictators, it is what will release them from years of Western oppression and set things right in the Middle East, especially if it means continuing to import their brand of terror to every corner of the globe. It all seems so simple to grasp. Why then are we arguing about the dangers Iran will bring to bear on America and every Middle Eastern neighbor? There are a few people who understand this part of the world better than our guest, former American ambassador to Saudi Arabia under President George W. Bush, author of the new book Desert Diplomacy, or Desert Diplomat, I should say, Inside Saudi Arabia Following 9-11, Robert Jordan. Ambassador, we thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Good to be with you. When you hear John Kerry talk about if there's any intransigence, if there's anything, unwillingness, anything happening that we will walk away from a deal, you've been in a lot of these talks before. Do you believe him? I'm uh, skeptical. I think he's trying to lower expectations uh, because we really don't know how this is going to come out. Uh, I think he's also trying to set up his own credentials as someone who will be a strict guardian uh, of the uh, correctness of, of any deal that we make. Uh, but I'm very skeptical. When you hear a lot of this talk here, in your opinion, is there anything diplomatic that still remains for the United States and its allies in order to get something done in Iran? Or quite frankly, has that ship sailed and in many cases sunk? Well, I'm not sure what the levers are. Uh, Iran certainly wants out from under the sanctions. And so uh, one of the big sticking points, of course, is when are the sanctions lifted and in what phase? Uh, they're due to get about a $100 million signing bonus right away, uh, which would be very nice for them. Uh, but it might, may very well allow them to con continue to wreak havoc uh, throughout the rest of the Middle East, uh, encircling Saudi Arabia, uh, pushing uh, their agendas with Hezbollah, with uh, the Houthis in Yemen, uh, in Lebanon and elsewhere. So I think we've got to be very concerned about that. Uh, we also don't have any information yet on exactly how tight a deal this is. Uh, what are the uh, reductions of uh, centrifuges, if any? What is the inspection uh, going to look like? How intrusive? Uh, what's the enforcement mechanism going to look like? And then, uh, assuming they do violate the agreement, as I think many of us uh, suspect, uh, what kind of snapback sanctions uh, could be reinstituted? And will our European allies and the Russians go along with it? Uh, a lot of unanswered questions. Ambassador, it's interesting. You use the phrase signing bonus in there, a very sports-oriented uh, idea, if you will. And it seems to me, and many times in others, that this is a game to the Iranians. No matter how you slice it, they are simply looking to play with the United States, to toy with them as much as they can, make them look as bad as they can, and still claim that they're the aggrieved party. How am I doing so far? Well, I think you're close. Uh, they certainly want to appear to be uh, playing with the big boys, and, and this is certainly the, the largest stage uh, they can play on at the moment. Uh, whether they can then claim some sort of victory after the negotiation is another matter that we're going to have to look at. My guess is if they do reach a deal, uh, the Iranians are going to be pounding their chest and say they out-negotiated us, and that's something our Congress is going to have to look at. Well, here's something else, and it seems like the Middle East is a little bit of everything these days. And now let's go ahead and turn to ISIS, if we can, for a moment. Again, it is almost the same sort of idea. The president saying there are no real boots on the ground in combat. There is an enemy that we cannot seem to get under control in any sense of the imagination. In your opinion, have we done enough? What are we not doing? Or is it simply the fact that we need to buckle down and understand this is an enemy that's not going to go away for a long time? We're in this for the long haul. Well, we've been kind of half-hearted about it so far. Uh, we have, as, as the president said one time, treated them as a junior varsity team to continue the sports analogy. And I think that's a huge mistake. Uh, we've underestimated them at every turn. Uh, we absolutely have to find a way to arm and train our allies in the region more. Uh, the Saudis have to step up, the Emiratis, the Jordanians all have to step up because this is initially their neighborhood. But it's also a huge threat to the United States. We can't ignore it uh, if those allies are inadequate at the moment, as they are. 
there was a report in the Washington Post that talked about ISIS, saying that they were, quote unquote, acting like the permanent government in the capital of Iraq's largest province. Are we looking at that as a possibility that they just may be there for so long that no matter what we do, we're eventually going to have to get down to diplomacy with an occupying force that's going to turn into a government? I think there's a decent chance of that, uh, very much the same way Hamas has taken over Gaza. Uh, we see now uh, huge portions, not just of Iraq, but also of Syria, uh, being actually governed uh, by ISIS. They're collecting taxes. They're uh, taking money out of the banks. They're selling oil, uh, acting very much like a state, and they have to be treated like a state in terms of military uh, conflict as well. As the Middle Eastern allies, our friends and our enemies, watch us work our way through those, those different countries and all these conflicts, you know these people. In your opinion, how do they see us then? Do they see us as really being well-minded Americans who are trying to do the right thing or just a bunch of bumblers who just can't get out of their own way? They're pretty disillusioned with us, uh, starting with uh, throwing Hosni Mubarak over the side in Egypt, uh, embracing the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, failing to do, do anything with Bashar al-Assad in Syria, and now cozying up to Iran in a deal that they think may well be a disaster. Uh, I think they really believe we don't know what we're doing. What is it that you believe that they're not going to ever forgive us for? Because there had to be, you mentioned a few things in there, but what is that one linchpin that they go back to saying, that's what tells us that the Americans have no clue what they're doing? I think a lot of it had to do with Mubarak. Uh, it was a... a uh, a huge mistake in their mind, and it made them feel that if we can turn our back on Mubarak in Egypt, then we can easily turn our backs on these Gulf monarchies uh, as well. You know Saudi Arabia very well. Your book certainly about that time you spent. The Saudi regime is changing, and they seem to be in many ways getting very close to the Islamists and the darker side. What do we make of that, and, and is there any way for us to stop that? Well, the Saudis uh, have a very difficult uh, balancing act that they have to undertake. They're trying to maintain their religious cr credibility with the religious establishment. Uh, they uh, need this to provide legitimacy to the regime. At the same time, uh, they're trying to drag their population kicking and streaming into the 21st century. Uh, so this is a very difficult balancing act. Uh, I think King Salman has tilted a little bit more toward the religious conservatives than King Abdullah did before he passed away. Uh, Salman has fired a couple of uh, uh, people that uh, Abdullah appointed. He's uh, uh, appointed more conservative uh, Islamist types uh, in their place, and I think uh, we're going to have to watch this very carefully. Uh, but part of it is to maintain their credibility in, in the Muslim world. It doesn't hurt for us to have an ally who has that credibility, but we can't allow uh, extremist ideology uh, to proliferate. Uh, we have to make it clear that uh, what's taught in the schools and what uh, is preached in the mosques is not just an internal matter for the Saudis, but it affects our national security as well. Then in your opinion, I've got 30 seconds left here. No matter what we do, no matter the fact that some people say the kingdom's antics are bordering on drunk driving, that we need to keep them tight, whatever we do, even though they are a problem in themselves. We have to have allies in the Middle East, and they're it. So we've got to make it work. Do you agree with those who say that this alliance is out of date? Well, I think it, needs, it certainly needs some marriage counseling, and I think we've got to make them responsible more for their own security, uh, more for their own neighborhood, but we've got to provide that assistance and training and stay close to them. Otherwise, it can unravel. We have to have allies. I think that's probably the best put there. Remind everybody, the book is brilliant. Desert Diplomat, Inside Saudi Arabia, following 9-11, you will learn things that the news media did not teach you before, and you will understand a lot more about the Middle East. Ambassador Robert Jordan, thank you so much for joining us. I hope we talk again. Great. Thanks for having me. All right. Take care. Coming up next, the political animal. There is a rise in the Republican Party, and not necessarily against a Democrat, but a rise against the Donald. We'll talk about that and more when the fastest 60 minutes of news continues.